And as per our tradition at Penn, as we welcome new members into our community to join us on space, we either are on our beautiful campus or in our virtual um, connections, we like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, Penn occupies the traditional homelands of the Lene Lenape. Penn acknowledges this fact and expresses gratitude to the indigenous people, both past and present, for the opportunity to live and learn on and through Lenape Hoking, land of the Lenape. Thank you. Um, and as we begin, just a reminder that this event is for the folks that have joined us in this space today. Um, so please, no recording of this event of any kind. We're excited to have you and, and want you to be able to, to feel comfortable participating. With that said, welcome. My name is Andrea Buchanan and I'm an assistant director of admissions here at Penn. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm really excited that you're joining us uh, today for our Identities at Penn event where we are celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander identities in honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, which is happening all of May. Um, we know that students really embody a lot of different identities and our goal today is to provide some space and also talk about um, insights into how students can bring their identities with them into college and university spaces, both in the academic sense and in the community sense and kind of everywhere in between. So with that framing, I, I want to make it clear that we're not going to be talking about the admissions process today. We're not going to be talking about application requirements or anything like that. We really want to focus this conversation on this specific and very human part of the Penn experience. Um, but we know that you may want that information later. And so in the chat, I will drop where you can visit and discover all of our virtual visit opportunities if you want to learn about Penn and attend an info session at another time. Um, today, I am joined by a couple of panelists from our wonderful Penn community, um, Professor Josephine Park and Peter Van Do, um, and they will really get to share their thoughts um, and their experiences and highlight their um, expertise and, and where they stand in our Penn community. And then later, towards the end of our hour together, we'll have time for some question and answers. I know we've gotten some great questions submitted ahead of time, um, and hopefully you'll be inspired throughout our um, conversation today. And so feel free to use that chat box to put those questions in. So for now, I will turn it over to Joe, um, and thank you all again for joining us. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and thank you to Tina, too, for your help in setting all of this up. And what a pleasure it is to be back on a panel with you, Peter. <laughs> Always a delight. All right. So um, I'm, as you can see on the screen there, I'm a professor of English and director of the Asian American Studies program here at Penn. And I'm delighted to talk to so many of you today. So um, last spring, when I began speaking about anti-Asian racism at various panels across campus, and usually my partner in crime was Peter um, in all of these panels, I was struck by hearing from Asian American students then that other people somehow don't believe that we experience racist attacks. Now, that there's been plenty of evidence to the contrary in this extraordinarily brutal year um, that we've endured, but it has been and really continues to be a particular quality of anti-Asian racism that it can fly under the radar and even seem har harmless. And I think many of us have had that experience where, you know, what's the big deal, right? And this is because it is so widely tolerated. We have, and we've seen in these months just how widespread it is, but also how vicious and how deadly uh, this racism can be. So um, I want to give you a little bit of a taste of my class. So I'm gonna rehearse a little bit of the foundations that I establish for my students when I teach my intro class, um, intro to Asian American literature. And when we read Asian American literature, when we study Asian American experience, we have to provide historical, political, cultural framing in order to read our expressive text. So this is some of what I do in my class. This is just a little taste of that. So in my intro class, I begin with kind of three key cases for understanding the management of Asians within the US 
beginning with the landmark case of Chinese exclusion. So I think that many of you maybe have heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And I'll just say um, that, you know, the Chinese came to America in the mid 1800s because everyone else did, right, for the gold rush, but they were the first to be barred from entry. And it's actually even hard to think of this, but there were no bars. Um, to entry to the US at that time. So the Chinese were the first immigrants to be excluded from entry to this country. And the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 barred Chinese immigrants for 10 years. Now, when this act was set to expire 10 years later in 1892, it was renewed. And then every decade after that until the 1940s when America needed China as an ally during World War II. Now, China was very angry about this exclusion. It had been a point of contention and something that had to be rectified for their wartime alliance. So, and it is worth emphasizing that it was only in the 1940s that Asians were eligible for naturalization to this country. So there was no pathway to becoming an American. And much of the sense of alienation, the, the categorizing of Asians as foreign, you could see some of the roots of that are very obvious here. That's case one. The second case I go over with my students um, talks about an, a different tendency of what I call colonial incorporation. And this is much less discussed in the popular discourse today. So the Spanish-American War of 1898, probably you heard about this, um, that ended with the transfer of the Spanish colony of the Philippines to American hands. And you know, that 1898, that was a, a moment for America when it took over the reins from a European imperial power. And at the time, there was a fierce debate within America about the politics and ethics of a former colony, America, which had fought bitter, bitterly against the British to then engage in its own outright colonial venture. And you can read, you know, um, Mark Twain had scathing comments to McKinley, President McKinley, about, you know, wanting to be another imperialist. Um, but the U.S., the U.S. annexed the Philippines until the end of World War II. So for nearly half a century, Filipinos were U.S. nationals, and that's a designation that perhaps some of you know about. Um, and in my class, I underscore the significance of this kind of colonial incorporation, incorporation as a colony, and that in, and in, as this years wore on in the 20th century, it would move on to what I would call a neo-colonial incorporation. Um, and the subsequent arrival of these subjects to American shores, you can imagine from Korea, from Vietnam, you know, all these kind of wartime contacts. Um, you know, we are here because you were there. That explains a lot of US uh, of Asians coming into the US, right? And then I, my third case in framing my class is Japanese internment. Um, and now I will say, um, We've now shifted away from that word internment, although I still use it sometimes, but Japanese incarceration, because that's what it was. And a case of what scholars, some scholars have called denationalization, in which American born citizens were deemed enemy agents, stripped of their citizenship rights, and incarcerated as prisoners of war. So it's worth noting that these Americans, two thirds of the um, imprisoned were US born. Remember, there's no way they could become American. Um, so though they were born in the US, they were shackled to enemy Japan. And that was a case of being totally kind of overdetermined by foreign policy. And, you know, there was an astounding demonization of Japanese. They were not considered human beings, which is why they could be rounded up and wholesale uh, incarcerated. And we hear the echo of these characterizations. We certainly heard the echo of them after 9-11. And we can see the echoes today as the U.S. kind of manages its present global contest with China, and it's and it will continue to be difficult and may get worse in some ways. So um, now Asian America, so that's kind of my foundation for understanding exclusion, the how incorporation works, and then this drive um, to um, ex expel um, Asian Americans and strip them of their citizenship rights. So Asian America itself is a vast and heterogeneous entity and it's brought together by policies like this. It's brought together by anti-Asian racism. So what I've been describing is we've been lumped together as perpetual foreigners and subject to, to a continuing set of demonizations. Now, I always say to my students that there's no natural core to Asian America. So if, I, if we compare to native, um, Americans, there's a kind of territorial commonality, right? 
at Latinx communities, there's a shared linguistic origin, African America, there's an originary trauma. Again, those are insane simplifications, but there's nothing like that for Asian Americans. But like all of these group formations, it is a conscious effort to inhabit a racial solidarity to insist on a common cause of anti-racism. So, um, you know, there is a distinction between um, ethnic um, and racial identity that I like to underscore in my classes that I am Korean American, that's my ethnic identity, and everyone can be ethnic, can be Irish American, Cuban American, right? And so that's a liberal universalizing ideology. But when I become Asian American, I'm choosing a racial subjectivity and exposing a history of systemic racism and injustice. So um, the formation of Asian America is a radical response to this history of racism. So the political entity was born in the late 1960s, a period whose activist echoes today, we can kind of hear everywhere. And that was a moment when students called for racial solidarity. It was the first time that different ethnic groups created what we called a pan-ethnic coalition into a racial solidarity. Um, and this was a moment of cultural and political transformation. So um, that the racial identity that responds to structures of inequality means that Asian America is a racial formation, right, in which multiple ethnic groups can come together. And I want to emphasize, you know, before 1960, there was kind of no reason, there was plenty of bad blood between different ethnic groups from Asia, and that exists today. But we need to work toward a racial solidarity in order to combat these attacks that we're experiencing. So uh, one thing, I really want like to emphasize in my courses is that the formation of Asian America was deeply indebted to African American models and the moral force of the civil rights movement and the resistant call of black power. So Asian America was born from these models of racial solidarity and resistance. And today the coalition of Black Lives Matter is critical too. And I think it's a critical resource for us as Asian Americans to understand how to fight for and sustain our rights. And you know, race in America is structured along a black white axis and Asians are enlisted into this structure. It can seem that the black white divide ignores Asians, but it's not that we don't matter in this structure, it's that we're manipulated within it and that we sometimes manipulate it ourselves. And this is something we have to be very attentive to. And this is a, a key part of the lesson of um, the radical field of Asian American studies. So, you know, the I usually turn to the example of the model minority as a key for formation, you know, a very divisive one, um, which I'm sure you've all heard of, right? So that was a category explicitly designed to discipline African Americans. So the term was coined in the 1960s to valorize Chinese and Japanese families at the expense of Black families, which were deemed dysfunctional. So, you know, and what we see today, you know, is like, the drive to dismantle affirmative action in universities, this hits home for us, right? It zeroes in on the Asian American model minority as a kind of means to keep out other students of color. So it's important that we're aware that the model minority is the other face of this kind of demonization of Asian Americans. One is good and the other is bad, but both serve the needs of racist hierarchy. And you can be a good Asian, you can be a bad Asian, but that means you just won't be an American. So this is something that is critical to understand in Asian American studies. So how we combat anti-Asian racism is by combating systemic racism. It is by joining forces with Black lives. And we've witnessed this extraordinary movement. And I encourage us not only to take part, but to learn from its ethics, organization, and passion to call for a kind of cultural literacy of Asian America and political redress for the crises of Asian America as well. So we're learning to name Asian American victims, and we have to work to dismantle monuments of anti-Asian policy, right? And these are all things that people are starting to come together to do, which is one of the great silver linings of this difficult period. Um, and as we comprehend that Asian American lives are linked to Black lives, we should educate those that we stand against, but also those we stand with who are often 
it's not an easy lesson, in fact, and that's one of the reasons why this field is so important. So this is where our program, Asian American Studies, comes in. So academia has been critical to the formation of this racial solidarity. And so at the core of that movement period in the 60s and 70s was a call to decolonize higher education and to educate ourselves on the history, experience, and expression of this new entity of Asian America. So activist students famously agitated at San Francisco State University. That was you know, that was the heyday uh, to insist on the study of race. And academia has been a primary means of disseminating this new understanding. And this work is vital now. So, um, you know, on the panel that Peter and I were on last month, a question that we got in the chat was, um, are Asians people of color? And I thought, yes, you know, but it's incredible to me that that, you know, this is a question that reveals how much our society needs to learn. We need to understand the racial formation of Asian America. And so our program here was formed 25 years ago when Asian American undergraduate and graduate students agitated for a course of study devoted to their history, society, and culture. So realize, you know, students take an active part in their education. And Asian American studies is a product of student activism for the birth of the field and for us here at Penn. And our students remain extremely committed to the program. They, they support us and we support them. And we, we make campus leaders actually out of our students who um, support our cause. Um, so our program is, has a core of three disciplines, sociology, history, and English. And Asian American studies is an interdisciplinary field. And these different disciplines are kind of integral to the contours of the field, but then it's actually expanded much more broadly within the humanities and social sciences. You can find Asian American art historians, musicologists, political scientists, psychologists. So it's a really important and burgeoning field. And we offer an undergraduate minor with a set of core courses in these foundational disciplines and other electives. And Peter Van Do teaches a wonderful course uh, for us in the program. Um, and I'll just say that the students who are our minors come away from Penn with an expertise in this field and an awareness that's sorely needed today. We've been hearing from our alums in these times from business, law, and medicine, and learning that what they've learned in our classrooms, they've been inspired to change corporate workplace policies, improve legal protections for immigrants, and provide better access to care for minorities. Like our students have been doing that from the expertise that they've gained from our program. So, you know, the real work we do in our courses results in these kind of active commitments um, from our alums down the line. So now I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joe Park. It is, it's really, uh, it's, it's always such a blessing and joy to, to hear, um, you know, a Dr. Joe Park talk about or, or offer us uh, this this uh, form of a mini lecture. I, I always hear um, the different bits and pieces of it, and it, it just never really. Um, it's always a, it comes across as very new uh, to me, and certainly as we experience um, probably one of the most toughest years uh, in 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 our memories. I think that especially due to the light of the increase of anti Asian violence, it's even more important to understand our histories and also. Uh, find the importance of spaces like Asian America studies um, at our institutions. Um, I'm going to share my screen, uh, if I may, who can share? Here we go. <clears throat> can you all see? Okay. Yes, looks good, Peter. Thank you. Uh, so I have to say that, like from my side, um, I'm not the most tech savvy. I'm not the most savviest around technology, and so um, I have in front of me two laptops. So one with my notes, and I don't have a printer. So like uh, printing notes out was was not part of the options uh, that I can uh, implement. But um, if I'm looking away from the screen, uh, don't don't um, you know uh, don't don't be bothered by that. I'm just looking at my notes uh, just to. Um, you know, offer all the information that um, uh, that I would like to offer you. Um, just to start off, uh, my name is Peter Van Do, uh, or Peter Van Do in Vietnamese. I use he, him pronouns. I serve as the director for the Pan Asian American Community House, otherwise known as Patch at Penn, the Asian and Asian American Cultural and Resource Center on Penn's campus. 
Uh, as uh, Dr. Joe Park has mentioned, I also act as a lecturer for Asian American Studies at Penn. I teach the Asian American Pop Culture course, and I also serve as a pre-major advisor for the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Patch has been uh, developed or founded since uh, the fall of 2000, and before then, uh, Asian American Studies was developed, I want to say, fall of 1996. And uh, during the establishment of both uh, spaces, uh, they, they were uh, really developed through the activism of our undergraduate students, graduate students, professional students, alumni, faculty and staff, postdocs, and local community partners. And this past year in 2020, Patch turned uh, 20 years old. And uh, Patch was founded during the same time as MAKU, the Black Cultural Resource Center and La Casa Latinx, uh, the, the Latinx Cultural and Resource Center. And Maku turned 20 in, tw in 2020, and La Casa turned 20 in 2019, respectively. Patch is uh, currently located in the Arch Building, which is essentially on campus on Locust Walk near the Love Statue. If you've ever been on campus, uh, you, you know, one of our uh, uh, um, uh, not noticeable uh, uh, markers on campus is the Love Statue, uh, which is very Philadelphian as well. Um, and within the Arch Building, our center sits right next to the Maku Black Cultural Resource Center and La Casa Latinx Cultural Resource Center. And we also work closely with other cultural resource centers on campus, like the Greenfield Intercultural Center, the Penn Women's Center, and LGBT Center. And Patch serves as a welcoming space for undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. And I also want to mention that we celebrate South Asian, Southeast Asian, Pacific Islander, and East Asian American cultures. And we use the verb celebrate purposely to express that we are a center that welcomes Asians and non-Asians. Uh, quite essentially, anyone can celebrate and partner with us. And we also use the words Asian American communities, plural, to acknowledge the diversity of Asians and Asian Americans and to point out that Asian America is not a monolith. We include first-gen low-income, women, LGBTQ+, international, religions, for example, Muslim, lower caste, mixed race, immigrant status, undocumented, disabilities, and Pacific Islander, Southeast Asian, South Asian, and East Asian perspectives, for example. Uh, currently, we have two full-time staff members, Hitomi Yoshida and myself, and we are here to support students around community building, leadership, and personal development. And just think of us as uh, any mentor, family mem member, or teacher that had your back. Quite essentially, in a similar vein, we, we act in this role for you too. Some uh, factoids I like to bring up uh, include that there are over 100 student organizations that are associated with our center, uh, whether they identify as a cultural, organization, but performing arts organization, Greek organization, religious organization, et cetera. Some of our groups are well known internationally, nationally, and locally, and or have received acknowledgement, acknowledgements via tournaments, community service initiatives, and so on and so forth. We support Asian, and we support American citizens of Asian descent as well as Asian international students. The way we define Asian America is it's a, perhaps uh, different than Penn admissions, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty clear cut is it whether you're, you're a citizen of the United States or you're green card holding or what have you. Um, but the way we defined Asian American is, is uh, within the field of, of how the field of Asian American studies uh, defines Asian American. And so um, if you think about all the stories and the history that's uh, included within that academic field, uh, we, we learn about the stories of those who immigrated to here in the United States, uh, those who came here as temporary um, workers. Uh, and some of these folks, uh, in, in respects to these temporary workers, they, they come here uh, with intentions to uh, go back to the mother country, but some actually stay. And so all those stories are, are included, which is why, um, you know, when we use the term Asian American, we, we include international students too, because in some ways international students are doing something, something similar, but the labor might be a little bit different. As uh, uh, Joe, Joe, Dr. Joe Park mentioned earlier, we have a very close relationship with our academic partner on campus, which is Asian American Studies, and I teach in, 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 the, in the program. 
And then uh, also we strive to continue the, tradition, the traditions of those that helped start the Asian American movement, a movement that was inspired by the civil rights era. And one of these traditions include the following, one, partnership and solidarity work with black, indigenous and people of color communities. Two, emphasizing the importance of ethnic studies and Asian American studies and is another tradition. And then three, connecting and encouraging students to connect and partner with the local Asian and Asian American communities. And also expanding upon these traditions. Uh, more recently, we have been talking about intersectionality. And I think that that's also very much important in line with uh, our community building within the Asian American movement. Currently, Patch staff support and directly advises us and, and, and uh, partners with 19 student organizations. Uh, and these, uh, what we call Patch student arms, include 78, the Asian American first gen low income space, Spice Collective, the Asian American femme space or non men space, the Radical South Asian Collective, Apali, the leadership initiative, Peer, the first year mentorship program. APAW, the Asian Pacific American Heritage Week program series, and Penn API Politics Civic Engagement Space. And there are so many, and I know that there's a list that was in the first slide, but uh, this is uh, just something to, to share as, and also offer as, as, uh, as the breadth of what, what we do. So there are 19 student groups, and then uh, within those 19 student groups, there are 300 plus student leaders and board members, and including within those 19 student groups, our student arms, there are 800 plus regular members. And I'm not including the 100 plus that I mentioned earlier. Uh, th these are the 19 groups that Patch staff directly advises. And then, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier in, in naming uh, some of our uh, 19 student arms, uh, these are some of the programs and events that are produced by our 19 arms, uh, some of which include leadership development, uh, with, which includes a retreat, peer mentorship, Heritage Week, civic engagement, and first gen, and more. I also want to mention that you know uh, within our programs, we've been really uh, focusing a lot on it around the promising practices around community building and how do we make sure people feel welcome. Uh, and part of that includes acknowledging that Asian America is not a monolith, but also celebrating the diversity within Asian and Asian American uh, spaces. And in addition to that, we've been having a lot of uh, thoughtful and intentional uh, conversations and dialogues around, for example, civic participation and uh, voting engagement within the API community, uh, community building and how to dismantle systems of oppression, uh, not only outside, but within ourselves as individuals and within our communities. Uh, when the Black Lives Matter resurgence happened and still continues today, uh, last summer, um, a lot of our students wanted to talk about family discussions around racism and how we can support the Black Lives Matter movement. And then also uh, code switching as, as, a, um, as, a, as an idea uh, within the community and outside the community. So that gives you the sort of the breadth and the understanding of what we do uh, as a cultural and resource center on campus. And uh, now I'd like to transition into uh, some of the work that we've done in, in response to the increase of anti-Asian violence that Dr. Joe Park and I are, are members of. Uh, there's, there's a task force called the Task Force on Support to Asian Asian American Students and Scholars, which I have to highlight that this is, um, it was established back in April, 2020. Uh, but there was no intentions for it to sustain itself uh, more than a year or two. And so uh, it, it will evolve into a working group under new leadership. But overall, what I can provide as history of the task force is to state that in April 2020, Penn established the task force on support of Asian Asian American students and scholars, also known as TAS, to coordinate and enhance support to members of the Penn community experience increased stigma, bias, discrimination, and violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the objectives of this task force are to, one, coordinate university support for Asian Asian American members of the Penn community. Two, signal the university's determination to combat stigma, discrimination, and bias. And three, provide a platform for outreach to concerned Penn community members. And then ongoing initiatives include efforts to raise awareness of the support and resources that Penn 
can provide to those who have experienced anti-Asian bias and ways to, and ways to report these incidents. So there was a campaign that was uh, developed called Fight in the Hate that aimed to, to raise awareness of anti-Asian bias and to also encourage all members of the university community to stand against it. I, from my side, uh, acted as the, the lead uh, for the program series. So within TAS, I partnered with Penn stakeholders, colleagues, students, and alumni to co-lead our program series on addressing the increase of anti-Asian violence. And the title of this uh, series is called Stopping the Hate and Starting to Heal, Living with and Through COVID-19 Pandemic. And so uh, I can best describe uh, this um, uh, uh, program series. It can be divided in three parts. And you can see that on the slide, one part would be around education on the history and social political context uh, through panel discussion series. Uh, we had a wonderful panel discussion series with some of our alums and current students around activism. And that was the beginning of our program series. Uh, we had another panel uh, in working with uh, the Japanese American National Museum uh, and also Muslim communities around uh, anti-Asian uh, violence or bias uh, towards those two communities, uh, as 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 Joe, Dr. Joe Park mentioned back in World War II with the Japanese internment camps, and then more more recently in the last couple of decades uh, since 9/11 towards uh, Muslim identified folks. And then there's uh, the second part is the community building and healing uh, 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 part of our program here. So we provided space for people to uh, get things off their chest and, and be in community and, and support uh, around um, these experiences. And then the third uh, would entail uh, workshops and training. So we had a upstander bystander training with a local, not a local, but a national nonprofit organization called Hollaback, uh, and also mental wellness and, and brave spaces and anti-Asian race, racism workshops too. So I'll give you some some quick uh, you know imagery of of, uh, of of the posters for some of these events. So this is the alumni panel and current student panel that we did. Uh, this is the one with the uh, Japanese American National uh, Museum. This is an amazing panel that we did with uh, the current faculty uh, associated with the Asian American Studies program. This is another example of restorative practice uh, circles that we've done uh, throughout the, the year. This is the bystander intervention program. What is mental wellness? And this is a, a, a program uh, by Dr. Ramani around gaslighting and creating uh, brave spaces. Another program that we collaborate with Asian American Studies around uh, ICE and uh, its um, relationship with uh, Southeast Asian refugee communities uh, from the Vietnam War. And we also uh, partnered with students. Uh, this is a great example of our, our philosophy. We, we uh, partner and support students and their ideas. And one student had the idea, a Chinese international graduate student had the idea of uh, having uh, Chinatown buses uh, to um, to visit the the local Chinatown in Philadelphia uh, because of um, the the uncertainty of the mass transportation system, but also feeling safety. And so we were able to partner in them, uh, as well as other student organizations. On that, we had a vigil uh, around gun violence, uh, the situation that happened in Atlanta and Indianapolis uh, towards sick uh, individuals. This is also a great program that we did uh, that's not related to the task force, but uh, we collaborate with the other uh, five and we are the six uh, cultural and resource center um, uh, spaces. And so we did a, a program around food and storytelling. And so we invited some uh, uh, spoken word artists. And this is uh, another example of the solidarity work that we uh, we provided and also is related to uh, Dr. Joe Parks. Uh, 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 lecture. We also did an end of year celebration. We cried, we invited a Korean vegan. I don't know if you're on TikTok, but that well, that was a, a, a an experience and joy to hear the the powerful words of uh, of a TikToker slash a social media uh, influencer. And we've also given out stoles. Uh, uh, we had the opportunity to go back on campus to offer stoles for those who are graduating, both uh, all undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. And then we had a recent uh, alumni event uh, with, with our uh, Asian alumni uh, group. And so, so th these are uh, some examples of, of what, uh, you know, what we've been doing this past year around the increase in anti-Asian violence. But also I hope that you have an understanding of, of how we provide community and space for, for all of our, our, our stakeholders. And that's uh, our main goal is for students, undergrad, graduate and professional students, but 
We also uh, act as a hub for faculty, staff, postdocs, alumni, and local QE members. So I'll stop it from there. So we have time for Q&A. Thank you both so much. Um, I have learned so much just in this short time. And as an Asian American myself, it's like always great to hear about these new resources and things that I too can access as part of the, the Penn community. And I know that our students really benefit from um, even in this time. And I think, um, you know, as we are getting questions into the chat, so feel free to use the Q&A box um, to kind of drop your thoughts in there or, or other questions that you might have for our panelists. Um, one thing I would love to ask both of you, kind of reflecting back on this year, you know, is how you were able to transition to support, you know, students that you mentor, that you are close with, whether it's in your, your programs or in your communities, kind of in this virtual setting. And hopefully the, you know, a new chapter is on the horizon and we'll be able to, to gather and hug again in, in the Arch Building, but were there, there other ways or, or spaces you were able to connect um, during this time? Yeah, Joe, I, I could answer this question unless you have something. No, I, I was going to say you go. Okay. <laughs> um, Andrea, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned about hugging, you know, it's, it's a, uh, those are also the, the limitations. I remember when I was on campus, uh, giving out patch stoles and I was giving these elbow bunts of, to, 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 to students uh, uh, just because uh, we're, we're not out of the woods just yet. Um, but with a, there, there's hope on the horizon because, uh, you know, we've been getting uh, messages from our, our leaders of our institution that we're, we're moving back in over the summer. And if all things goes well, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll all be in person uh, this coming fall. But to answer your question, uh, it's a complicated, there's a, it's a complicated question because, you know, throughout this whole process, especially in the beginning, uh, when we were put into quarantine back in uh, March to 2020, uh, we had to really relearn um, what were, what are the promising practices around community building. And so, uh, because there is no sort of like a guidebook uh, to handle these situations and doing everything virtually or what have you. Um, but I think that the, the guiding North Star for us has always been to really hone in on the community and also do these check-ins and also elevate and develop spaces for people to um, be comfortable to share um, how they're feeling and how do we work together as a community to develop uh, promising practices to support each other. And so I think that, you know, um, and at the same time also mental wellness and self-care, right? And we all have to relearn all of these things. And I, I would argue that we are still continuing to, to learn. Uh, what this all means, uh, especially mental wellness and community building and what have you. Um, also leadership, what does that mean within, uh, you know, moving from in-person to virtual and what have you. But I would have to say that um, really uh, compassion is part of the ingredient, uh, patience, understanding, thoughtfulness, and, and listening. Um, but also empowering, you know, folks to to, to really speak up and then uh, and and to share their stories and and to find their their power uh, within uh, learning, you know, as we are all learning together. Um, but certainly, certain communities have been impacted the most. I would say um, when we were given the notice about the depopulation of campus and going into quarantine, uh, some of the communities that reached out to us. Uh, happen to be international students, uh, first-gen low-income students. Um, I would love to connect more with undocumented or DACA-affiliated students. Uh, that's always been uh, something that we make ourselves available, but uh, there, there's a, you know, a cultural um, uh, you know, relationships uh, around uh, being um, uh, affiliated with those identities. Uh, but I think that, you know, it, Learning is always going to be the key. You know, uh, it's great to have Asian American studies, and it's great to have the space like Patch to to learn promising practices around community building. But that that's also our process too. And what I personally have learned 
is that like, we, could, we could do more, you know, um, be, even before uh, quarantine of COVID, around COVID-19, we worked and like we worked really hard to build that relationship with our Muslim uh, communities. And so we worked with the chaplain, uh, the Muslim uh, Student Life Chaplain, and also the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. And also before COVID-19, we worked hard to connect with uh, Pen for Immigrant Rights, which is our undocumented and DACA affiliated space. But also after the quarantine, I realized that we need to do more work around uh, supporting and uh, connecting with the uh, student groups like the Assembly for International Students, uh, which I'm, I'm glad to say that we built uh, that, that relationship. Um, also uh, in support of our Pacific Islander communities and Native Americans uh, due to the Black Lives Matter resurgence last summer, we uh, really uh, have been hearing a lot of discussion around anti-Blackness, but also anti-indigeneity. And so um, we, we've really uh, established that community with uh, the student group natives at Penn. Um, and also uh, connecting with the, the, the overall gov student government groups on campus too. I think all of those really play into uh, that community building. And all of this is done genuinely and authentically, is not transactional. Uh, that's that goes against uh, our, our 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 focus. It's really building connections, and I think that that also served as a north star for for our communities too, building those connections authentically. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I do see these questions are coming into the Q and A, so I really appreciate um, all all of your thoughts so far from our audience. I believe as I was scrolling through, there's, you know, a couple of different questions. I know Professor Park, you mentioned this, that there's, you know, oftentimes this divide of, of whites and black and Asians are, are sort of maybe pulled in different directions, enlisted into that, that divide in, in ways that, you know, are, are ultimately maybe not of their, their choosing. And so, you know, thinking about the Asian American studies program, the role that education plays in, in learning, you know, where these, these differences come from and the impact that has going forward. I think, you know, there's questions around, like how can we bring that into our, our daily lives too? How, are, how can students that, you know, we don't find that identity as one that they hold, but one that they want to explore further, how can they uh, go through that that process and and to be an ally to those other communities or to be an ally of the Asian American community, the Black community, whatever community it may be. Thank you, um, Andrea, for bringing together that question. You know, um, I I see. Well, first of all, thank goodness Peter does all that he does, so I can like focus on the academic end of things because <laughs> there's so much else actually that's going on but i will say you know the classroom i believe that in a kind of asian american studies classroom in an ethnic studies classroom in an africana studies classroom we are at the front lines what what i really see as kind of a combat against racism and one of the things that we learn when we learn our our history um, and the kind of the range of experiences of Asian America um, is like we actually learn um, the number of connections that have been made throughout our history. So many rich and meaningful um, connections between different ethnic groups, between different racial groups, right? So, you know, when I talk about, for example, the influence of black power, well, there was something called yellow power back in the day. Now it's real old fashioned, right? But the, there was um, a really in, intimate alliance between at that time, it was really East Asian um, and African American groups, largely in the West and California. But it, you know, it was understood to be a common cause. And you saw actually a lot of activists, black power activists who were really invested in larger um, crises of decolonization in the globe. And that, that was a moment of like where third world liberation was a rallying cry. And that was, that was a kind of international engagement on the part of African Americans and Asian Americans. And that's a, that's a moment of like this Afro-Asian connection that it's important to learn about. I think that we may not, um, many of us are just not aware of kind of the history of these connections and actually how we have relied on each other 
actually, to, and you know, if we look at um, the cause of immigrant rights, that's been a connection between Asian Americans and Latinx communities. You know, so there are actually multiple connections that are incredibly important to explore. It's very easy to get, I mean, this is Peter's point, to get this kind of monolithic perception of Asian America. So on the one hand, it's interesting. I make a giant deal in my class about how we need the solidarity of Asian America over and above the ethnic specificity of being, say, Korean American for me. Um, but at the same time, that the, that sense of Asian Americanness it has lost that political edge, and now it's become a kind of empty descriptor in some ways. So what I'm invested in in the classroom is to re-inject that racial awareness. You know how much this is a formation that relies on a political solidarity, but also at the same time to to resist that kind of flattening where it just seems like it's East Asian people of a certain income bracket. You know that's really dangerous. Um, and that's a way in which, you know, Asian American, you know, um, subgroups, ethnic groups, they occupy the highest echelons of our society and the lowest. And so that's actually not seen. And I noticed actually a question in the chat, you know, why, why do college applications ask for um, my ethnicity? And that's actually really important for these reasons. It's incredibly important to disaggregate right, to, to, to separate the group. Um, it's incredibly important for us who in higher ed to know that we have this many Hmong students, right? That we have this many um, Vietnamese American students, Cambodian students, I mean, that, that information is critical because we're, um, it's incredibly important to have a heterogeneous population and understanding that's a part of the education we provide here um, to really to advance our world. Kind of an inflated thing to say but that's what we hope to do i think ben franklin would want you to say that as well i think that is you know the, the mission of penn and i think that's what we see with our, our students and what they're doing with their knowledge is is to be empowered in that way and so um, i'm really glad you addressed that question too of why we we ask for that because it's it's not what is often portrayed as oh, we are looking for a student that checks x box or y box or this box but it's really to understand what this student is bringing to all of us um, and i want students to know you don't have to fill that out and that's not a requirement but that also it is a way to to make sure no one's making an assumption about you that you get to to speak on your own behalf in that way when when answering that question and so that's that's why that comes up sometimes another question that has come through in the chat is the idea of the model minority which is i know something that i grew up hearing a lot about um, so how does the the model minority really hurt the asian american and pacific islander and you know people who mostly believe that it's a positive thing and have a false perception that Asian American or Pacific Islander identities or people that hold those uh, adjacent identities don't need um, assistance and, and what can we do to challenge the whole model minority myth. Peter, do you want to start on that? No, I'll start and let you. <laughs> I mean, that's a big one. You know, it, it's funny. Um, I often have students who actually um, champion the model minority myth or will claim that in fact their families have um like their family structure is especially conducive to i don't know what advancement education you know you'll hear these claims um and obviously these are constructions that we make um the problem with the model minority myth is that first of all it um it is extremely punitive actually to Asian Americans who don't actually fit the mold. So, and it is, um, and for those who don't actually look like the model minority or behave like one, you know, it it's deprives them of resources um, because it's thought, oh, they don't need anything, right? Um, so that's a kind of small, um, attack at it. But the bigger point is that it is a dehumanizing um, standard. It is a dehumanizing characterization. What is it to be a model minority, right? And, you know, it's on the one hand, 
it's it's dehumanizing. It gives a kind of superhuman power, but it also is something that excludes us, right, from the normal run of people, and that's very disturbing. Um, but also, when when one minority is held up as the model, how does it feel for other minorities, right? And so it's an incredibly divisive tactic, and it's used in very material ways. So as you mentioned, Andrea, you know, like actually groups, um, Asian immigrant groups that were actually not given access to public assistance, right, was then held up as examples that you don't need public assistance that then to like cut assistance for communities that are in dire need of assistance because the world that they grew up in that they were born to was deeply, deeply unfair, right? And so what it does is it permits unfair um, social and political practices to perpetuate. It's a wonderful way of keeping things going where privileged people get to enjoy their privilege because they earned it, right? And so um, it's an incredibly pernicious um, discourse and it hurts us um, a lot. So maybe Peter, you probably have more to say on this front. Um, <clears throat> I don't have much to say, but uh, what I can say is that um, it's part of this divide and conquer sort of phenomenon that I, I often equate to uh, how Western European countries have um, you have have modeled themselves in conquering other parts of the world, uh, primarily uh, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And I could use Asia as as an example. Uh, so in Burma, the lowlanders were pitted against the highlanders by the Great British, uh, great by the English. Um, and then the, the English also uh, divided South Asia by religion uh, based on Muslim identified folks and Hindu uh, identified folks. And then in French and Middle China, uh, you know, Cambodians were pitted against Vietnamese, Vietnamese were pitted against Lao, and then there's Chinese Vietnamese or Chinese Cambodians or Chinese Lao uh, folks who were pitted against those uh, native uh, folks uh, from, from those, those respective areas as well. And I can't, I can't dis disconnect this phenomenon, even though the United States wasn't around, it itself was a colony, but it has uh, replicated itself in, in, in many ways to uphold the system. And so since the civil rights era, uh, there has been fear towards a uh, black um, uh, empowerment uh, through that, 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 that time. Uh, and, and so, Automatically, Asian Americans were elevated as the model minority. And before the that that era, Asian Americans were interned, uh, as Dr. Joe Park has mentioned earlier. Asian Americans have been excluded, uh, and and certainly were 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 put into spaces uh, that I would call ghettos. Uh, in Ch Chinatowns, although there's a sort of like a cultural tourism element of Chinatowns, uh, they those places are still ghettos uh, in my mind. And so, uh, so there becomes this divide and conquer that has been developed and replicated uh, automatically, as, as Dr. Joe Park has mentioned, um, to dehumanize, but also pit each other against each other so that uh, those who are in privileged positions can stay in power. I think that one of the things that I've learned this past year in, in helping out with uh, the program series and addressing anti-Asian violence is also to um, build more connections um, with other people of color as well as uh, within Asian Asian American spaces. And um, well, I never really put it into words uh, until developing this program series, but um, the, our vision for the program series and also within our spaces within Patch uh, include, you know, around anti-Asian violence, that Islamophobia is real and that there are many South and Southeast Asians and other communities that are impacted whether they identify as Muslim or not, the act of anti-Asian racism and violence due to Islamophobia is happening to this day and needs to be recognized and addressed within our communities and outside our communities. Anti-Asian violence is made possible due to anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity. And I would say that there's an overlap with Pacific Islanders, uh, with uh, Indigenous groups, as well as with Asian Americans. And then also anti-Blackness does indeed happen within Asian, Asian American communities, and we need to recognize and address this. And then also, which I really think that's why Asian American studies is so important, ethnic studies is so important, is that there is a history of Black, Indigenous, 
and people of color solidarity. And that there is a history of the solidarity between BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color communities uh, within our, our, our own respective spaces, but also with aspiring allies. And uh, it's just unfortunate that these, um, uh, these stories and uh, this history of, of, of community building and connectedness are often invisible. Thank you, Peter, for those reflections. And I know that we are approaching our hour, um, but I do want to, to recognize that, you know, Penn is always a, a growing institution. We're always innovating, we're learning, and we're not afraid to turn that critical eye to ourselves. And so um, another question that has come through is what can, what do you believe, you know, Penn can do to improve in terms of supporting um, the AAPI community? Well, I have to say the Asian American Studies program has been fighting hard at Penn. You know, like it actually wasn't so easy to form it. Like the students fought to get this established. They have been fighting ever since to keep it going, to keep our funding consistent and to grow our funding. And we're now presently, um, fight, well, we've actually had this really welcome announcement from the deans that we will be able to hire new faculty in Asian American Studies, which is actually a kind of like an unbelievable, uh, thing for us. So um, yeah, we're working hard and we work with our students um, to convince uh, the administration that of the support that our students need. So I mean, it's it takes some work, it takes some leadership among our students. And yeah, it's it's a it's actually a wonderful leadership opportunity for our students, but it's not easy. Yeah, and I agree. I, I think that, you know, there's in many ways uh, having the space uh, examples, you know, the resources and the, the thoughtfulness that our institution has dependent as an institution has for, um, you know, thinking around diversity, equity and inclusion. And I would also include the B belonging. Um, but certainly I think that uh, with with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, the thoughtfulness towards anti-Indigenous or thoughtfulness towards the Indigenous perspectives, but also um, this uh, awakening uh, of, with regards to people within and outside the Asian Asian American communities around our invisibility, our, 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 our experiences being invisible. Uh, I think that there's more opportunity, people are being more aware, but certainly there have been struggles around um, people making assumptions uh, uh, in respects to the stereotypes that are placed upon us. And so like Dr. Joe Park mentioned earlier, like, oh, we don't have any problems. Uh, they don't need any support or what have you. But uh, if, if, if we all sort of submit to all these stereotypes uh, that were put essentially developed uh, in, in racist, uh, with racism, uh, in, in, not maybe not intentionally, but perhaps intentionally, but maybe unintentionally, uh, we, we would, this would be a dehumanizing sort of process. And I think that uh, overall, uh, there has been awakening uh, within all stakeholders to, to think more thoughtfully to support not only Asian American communities, but also diversity at our institution. Thank you so much. And I know that we have hit our time, but I would like to close with like one last either piece of advice. I know we had a number of questions about how to be a strong ally to the Asian community, to other um, communities of color, of culture, of perspective. And so maybe that can be our, our final statement from our panelists. Uh, Joe, I can jump in. Uh, what would be my words of advice? I would say that my quintessential advice and what I've learned and what I observe with my students is that we all appreciate the technology that has been developed uh, within the last couple of decades, within sometimes for most of us uh, in our lifetimes. Um, but also there's this, uh, uh, you know, I guess the, the, the silver lining and, and the sort of the positive, if, if you can think of any positive during this, this uh, COVID-19 situation is that there's a newfound appreciation to connect and go back to uh, sort of the standards to, to connect with each other. But also in, in, in light of that, I also realized that, you know, this technology 
which is interesting and especially social media tends to sort of silo us within our own respective generations. And I, I see more and more uh, before COVID-19, uh, there's the separation between quote unquote generations. And when I think of generations, I think of like corporate marketers who crudely try to milk as much out of, you know, uh, and, and crudely sort of define, you know, these, these, uh, these, these markers that separate generations. But uh, certainly that siloing process happens through um, the social media, through our likes or what have you, and it further creates this divide but what I'm noticing with uh, our you know, process of being zoomed out and overly uh, dependent on this technology of everything virtual, uh, there, there's a, a, a need to, to go back to the basics around human connection and also connecting to other generations and also realizing that we've been shackled in many ways uh, uh, to be overly uh, productive and overly scheduled and how do we sort of move forward to still be successful but also value and prioritize um, you know connection with each other yeah i'll just say here here peter i'm all for connection especially oh my goodness after i can't even believe how we've been living um, but you know i will say in my the lecture course that i gave you a little hint of um, today, that's a big class, at least for English, that enrolls about 80 students, which is large for us. Um, and many, many of those students are not Asian American. Um, and in part because it fulfills a gen ed requirement, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but I will say, you know, the conversations in that class are rich, they're enlightening, and all of we're all learning from each other together. Right. And our classes are kind of opportunities to have the kinds of conversations that we're having here, the kinds of questions that you're asking. And, you know, higher education is the opportunity to study the stuff that you couldn't get right beforehand. So it's just, I feel privileged to be here and to be a part of those discussions here. Thank you both so much for leading us in this discussion. Thank you to our audience for joining us in this space. Um, we appreciate your, your candor, your honesty, and your wonderful questions. We hope that you found this reflective um, and that you were able to find something to celebrate. As Peter said, this is a verb that we can all do um, together, no matter where we come from. And so I hope you take that with you. Um, and thank you all. Have a good rest of your day, uh, no matter what point you are at. Bye-bye. <laughs>